All right, well, as you can tell, we are clearly in the season of Lent, and we're beginning to look towards Easter and what's coming up. Uh, let, so let, let me update you on your calendar, just so you'll be sure you know where you are. Two weeks from today is Palm Sunday. Two weeks from today is Palm Sunday, and then we're into Holy Week. Holy Monday, Holy Tuesday, Holy Wednesday, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, Easter. Now, we've been, done this for many years, but I, I want to remind you that we will be holding services all week long. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday will be in the upper room at 6 p.m. It'll be about a 45-minute service, praise and worship, music, meditation, and our what we're trying to do is, is walk with Jesus through that week. And so we're just we're seeing what Jesus was doing Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Monday, Thursday. And then on Good Friday, we'll be here in the main sanctuary at 7 p.m. So get, get that all straight. That Monday through Thursday, 6 p.m., about a 45-minute service in the upper room. Good Friday in the main auditorium. That'll be a full service with communion. And uh, that's going to be fantastic. All right, during, during the season of Lent, you know that we are looking at the cross as the wood between the worlds. And today, I want us to explore how Jesus understood his death. Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. This is the first time that Jesus has told his disciples that he's going to be killed. He's begun his ministry, he's been preaching, he's gathering followers, he has his twelve apostles. And there's that very defining moment when he asked the question, who do you say that I am? And it's Peter gives the correct answer. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus recognizes that as a revelation, a progress in revelation, that Peter has arrived at a very significant point. And so then Jesus begins to disclose more things. He says, all right, we're heading to Jerusalem. And that's a lot of what we emphasize in Lent is this final journey to Jerusalem. We're going to Jerusalem. The reason they're going to Jerusalem is so that Jesus will become king. That's what everybody's thinking. And that's true. That is true. But then he says, I know we're going up to Jerusalem. But in Jerusalem, I will be rejected by the chief priests and the elders. I'll be condemned and then I will be killed. And on the third day, I'll be raised. That's what Jesus says. And I think the disciples hear it like this. Uh, they just hear it as, it's going to be a failed attempt. But in the resurrection, I'll be part of the resurrection. So there's, they hear it as fatalism. That third, I'll raised on the third day. That could be, you know, in Hosea, there's that verse. In Hosea 6, verse 2. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up. It's kind of a euphemism for someday, eventually, in the sweet by and by. I think that's how they hear it. I'm going to go. I'm going to be killed. But you know, in the sweet by and by, I'll be part of the resurrection. I think that's how they hear it. And that's why Peter tries to talk Jesus out of it and says, this must never happen to you. We, we can't go in, to Jerusalem and you be killed. And Jesus' retort is very sharp. Get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. You're not setting your mind on the things of God, but the things of men. Two more times in Matthew's gospel, in Matthew 17, and then again in, for the third time in Matthew 20, Jesus privately foretells his death. But he gives no interpretive meaning. He, doesn't, he says it's going to happen. And I'm going to be raised. I'm going to be killed and I'm going to be raised. But he offers no interpretation as to what it means. And then they arrive in Jerusalem. Triumphal entry. And he's in Jerusalem during that final week. 
And for the first time, for the first time, Jesus begins to speak of his impending death publicly. And here's how that came about. So they're in Jerusalem. They've already arrived somewhere in the middle of the week. And some Greeks come to, well, they, they end up talking to Philip and Andrew. These are the two disciples of Jesus who have Greek names. So we might think that possibly their fathers were Greek, their mothers Jewish. They spoke Greek fluently. And the Greeks come to those two disciples and they're saying, we would really like to meet Jesus. And so Philip and Andrew bring this message to Jesus. There are some Greeks here at the festival and they want to meet you. And Jesus sees portent in that. He understands that, that his message, his life, what he's doing is not going to just stay within the Jewish world. It's going to go into all of the Gentile world. And Jesus says, well, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Now, remember, when Jesus says glorified, he means crucified. He means crucified. He says glorified, but he means crucified because that, in fact, is the glory of the King. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified, but he means crucified. People don't understand that, but he understands. And then, and then he, he it's, all, it's almost as if he's talking to himself. He says, I'm troubled, but unless, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. And what shall I say? My, my soul is troubled, though. Jesus doesn't go to his death calmly like Socrates drinking the hemlock. He feels the pressure, the anxiety, the human nature recoiling from death, especially a violent, torturous death. And again, it's as if he's talking to himself. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? It's for this purpose that I've come to this hour. Oh, so he's introduced the idea of purpose. I'm not going to ask the Father to save me from this hour. This will come back up again in Gethsemane. But no, it's, it's for this purpose. For this reason, I've come to this moment that will involve my death. And then he says this. John 16, verse 31. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I... When I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death that he was to die. Jesus uses the euphemism lifted up. He doesn't say crucify, but everybody knows what that means. And they hear Jesus say that, that I'm going to be crucified. But in this for the first time, as he publicly, not privately, but publicly tells them that he's about to be killed by crucifixion, he also gives interpretive meaning. I mean, if we're going to engage in atonement theories, perhaps we ought to let Jesus have his say <laughs> as to what is the meaning of his death by crucifixion. And what he says is that it's going to do three things. The effect of his being lifted up in, crucifix in crucifixion will have a threefold effect upon the world. It will judge the world, it will drive out the ruler of the world, and it will refound the world as he draws all the world to himself. And so let's explore these things. First of all, according to Jesus, the cross judges the world. He says, now is the judgment of this world, referring to his being lifted up in crucifixion. The cross is where the world as it is, organized around violent power. The world organized around an axis of power enforced by violence that was established in the very beginning by Cain and then all of the successors following that same pattern the cross is where that world is decisively judged. That is civilization founded on killing. The world to be judged is a world organized around 
the organizing principle of societal violence, of establishing a violent center and then organizing everything around it. Before Jesus can refound the world, that's what he's intending to do. Before he can refound the world, he has to judge the world as it is. He has to make the definitive judgment that this arrangement of the world is condemned. Now, Jesus himself, after his arrest, is condemned to death under the auspices of two men, two very important men in Jerusalem. Joseph Caiaphas, the high priest, he was the son of Annas, son-in-law probably of Annas, who had been a priest for a long time, the high priest for a long time, and he was basically retiring now. And now Joseph Caiaphas was in his first year of being the high priest, which was a position that was purchased from the Roman emperor. But it was a very lucrative and powerful position. So Jesus was first judged under the auspices of the high priest Joseph Caiaphas and then he was tried in the legal court under the Roman governor Pontius Pilate and these two men and the institutions they represent uh, they represent towering achievements in human civilization they represent religion and politics which is sort of the core of civilization religion and politics that's what draws us together, that's what makes us a society, that's what forms our culture. And Jesus was tried and condemned on both religious and political grounds. So in the, in the religious court, he's convicted of blasphemy. You know, there's that moment, at first Jesus doesn't say anything, and then Caiaphas puts him under oath and says, I adjure you by the living God, tell us, are you the son of God? Jesus says, as you say. And from now on you will see the Son of Man ascended and seated at the right hand of the glory of God. And then they tear their robes and cry blasphemy. And so for blasphemy in the religious court, Jesus is sentenced to death. And then he's brought before Pilate, the Roman governor, where he is convicted of sedition, I suppose would be treason, sedition, something like that, because if Jesus is only claiming to be a prophet, a religious figure, Pilate does not care. He just doesn't care. It doesn't matter to him. Uh, what matters is if he actually does claim to be a king. So that's why Pilate is not interested in any of the arcane debates among the Jewish people about their religion. He just goes right for the one question that he cares about. Are you king? Because if he claims to be king, that's a problem. Because who are the kings? The kings are the kings appointed by the emperor in Rome, Tiberius. You're a king because Tiberius says so. And that's why they have a King Herod, King Herod Antipas at this point, because Caesar says so. If someone of their own accord, though, is not just you know, insane but actually has a following and saying, I'm the king, well, this is sedition, this is treason, this is a revolt, and this is going to be a capital crime. And so two courts condemn Jesus to death. We could say it this way, that the condemnation of Jesus Christ was issued from the gilded sanctuary of religion and the marbled hall of justice. We could speak of anachronistically and say, Jesus was condemned to death by church and state. It's, it's yeah. Anachronistic, you see what I'm saying. This is Jesus trying the system. This is the system on trial. Okay, religion and politics, what do you do when God comes to you? What do you do? And the system as it was arranged, both religion and politics, condemned Jesus to death. That's the world being judged. You understand? That's the world on trial. That's the world being tested, and it gets an F minus. Those condemned to crucifixion by the Romans were crucified naked. Public nakedness was part of the shame heaped upon the crucified victim. 
Now, in religious art, to portray Christ as entirely naked is too much realism, and so we still don't go there, and rightfully so. But it just shows you that that, that still has this powerful element of shame connected to it. And so when Jesus was crucified, he was crucified naked. The shame of public nakedness was heaped upon him. And yet, the Apostle Paul works with that reality very creatively. And he says this in Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. He, being Christ, stripped the principalities and powers and put them to public shame triumphing over them in the cross. What does he mean by that? He means that when Caiaphas and Pilate, representing the towering achievements of religion and politics, the gilded sanctuary of religion and the marbled hall of justice and their vestments and their robes, and they look very dignified, when they crucify Jesus Christ, their pretense is stripped away. Their vestments are taken away. Their legal judicial robes are taken away. And their nakedness is exposed. And what do I mean by that? It means you claim that you have the right to rule the world because you claim to be wise and just. You are neither wise nor just. You are just ambitious. I see your naked bid for power. That's all you want. And that's what the cross does. It tries the world as arranged and finds it wanting. It says, yes, it, it knows how to surround itself with pomp and circumstance that lends an air of dignity, but behind it is simply the naked bid for power. Paul also says this, none of the rulers of the world understood, for if they had, they would never have crucified the Lord of glory. And that, the, these principalities and powers, these rulers of the world, they are not entirely operating on their own. There are spiritual forces behind all of that. that they're probably almost entirely unaware of. So I describe, you know, the principalities and powers as the very rich, the very powerful, the very religious, the institutions they represent, and the spirit that operates behind it and animates it. And so that's why Jesus says the second thing. First of all, first thing is going to happen is that the cross will judge the world. The cross will judge the world. If you see the cross properly, if you understand, you say, oh, the world as arranged is judged by the cross because in the crucial moment, you know, the, 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 the origin of the word crucial. In the crucial moment, when God came among us, our systems called him a blasphemer and a rebel and crucified him. The second thing that Jesus says that his death will accomplish is that it will drive out the ruler of the world, or we'll say it this way, the cross exercises the world. There in John it says, the ruler of this world will be driven out. That phrase, driven out, shows up in the Gospels 30 times in reference to Jesus driving demons out of afflicted people. So it's most, almost always exclusively connected with the idea of Jesus driving out evil spirits. And Jesus says that when he's crucified, it's going to drive out the ruler of the world or it's going to exercise the world. Here's the other two times that this phrase ruler of the world, Paul uses, he, he, Paul uses the term God of this world or God of this age. Jesus uses ruler of this age. It's a reference to the Satan. So, in John 12, 31, now the ruler of this world will be driven out. In John 14, 30, the ruler of this world is coming. He has no power over me. And then finally, the ruler of this world has been condemned. The Satan operates through 
these principalities and powers. Pontius Pilate isn't aware of this. Caiaphas isn't aware of this. The Roman Empire isn't aware of this. But the Satan, the accuser, is operating through it. And the Satan rules the world through accusation and violence. Let me say it this way. In our spiritual blindness, we almost never see the accusation and violence that sustains our institutions as evil. We don't see it as evil because the macabre dance around the maypole of violence achieves seemingly good things. Order, stability, security, and government. What we see is honor, courage, and the order violence brings to our society. What we don't see is the blood of the innocent victims. And there are always innocent victims. The bodies are always well concealed and the executioner's face is always well hidden. The accusation and violence that organizes organizes society under the sway of the God of this world is made sacred through myths and anthems, memorials and monuments, holidays and history books. This is how Satan disguises himself as an angel of light, as the Apostle Paul says. All right, so this is, this is prose. This is me describing it. But uh, what is a picture's worth? A thousand words? So here's a, here's a painting that... A very famous painting. You've probably seen it before. It's created in 1872 by John Gast, and it's called American Progress. Uh, I mean, just, just focus on the painting, and I'll tell you about it. This famous painting is an example of how the satanic is often disguised as an angel of light. In the painting... White settlers in covered wagons, stagecoaches, and trains are led steadily westward by the goddess Columbia, the deified personification of the United States. Columbia, appearing as a voluptuous feminine angel with blonde hair and clad in a billowing white robe, travels through the heavens, laying telegraph wire behind her as indigenous people and herds of buffalo flee into the darkness from her glorious advance. The message of the painting is that no matter what violence is visited upon the tribes of the American West, the American empire remains noble virtuous and ordained by heaven. All is justified in the name of progress. This is the satanic lie of every empire. This is the God of this world that Jesus drives out by his cross. I think the polar opposite image, there's another painting created about the same time by Sir Frank Dixie, and it's called The The Two Crowns. And this is a remarkable painting. So let's just look at this. What we see, I don't know how well you can see it, but it's, we have a medieval monarch has returned from battle, victorious. He's astride his steaming white stallion. His war horse. His his left hand holds to the reins of his mighty steed. His right hand grips the hilt of his sword. You know, this is the motif of equestrian statuary that's still popular around the world. And he's obviously victorious. The women are running out there and they're throwing flowers and everybody's celebrating. But none of this is what draws our attention. The painting is designed in such a way as that we're drawn right to the center, zoom. And what you see is the face of the king. And it's startled. You know, it comes out of Isaiah. He shall startle many kings. And he doesn't have the face of a exultant, triumphant warrior. He's startled. He's wearing his crown of gold. He's a conventional king that is won a conventional battle. 
But as we look at his startled face, what we do then is we follow what he, we look at what he's looking at. See, you see him, he's looking at something. He sees it out of the corner of his eye. And, he's, and what he sees is a life-size crucifixion or life-size crucifix of Christ. The monarch, the medieval monarch, is wearing a crown of gold. Christ, of course, is wearing a crown of thorns, thus the title of the painting, The Two Crowns. As we follow the gaze of the king, we see that he is looking directly at a life-size crucifix. The king with a crown of gold is astonished by the king with a crown of thorns. Thus the title of the painting, The Two Crowns. The king with a crown of gold has won his kingdom by the power of the sword. But the king with the crown of thorns has won his kingdom by his death upon the cross. The cross shames the pretentious propaganda of empire disseminated by the Satan. If we sit long enough with Christ crucified, it will become the place from which the God of this world, who rules through accusation and violence, is driven out. And this is the exorcism we need. Amen. So, how does Jesus understand his death? He says, first of all, it's going to judge the world. Secondly, it's going to drive out the ruler of the world. And then Jesus says, the cross draws the world. Because Jesus is doing no less than refounding the world. He's the second Adam. And he's refounding the world. And instead of being organized around an axis of power enforced by violence, the world now is to be organized around an axis of love expressed in forgiveness. He says, And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw... But actually it says drag. I will drag all people to myself. That's how David Bentley Hart in his translation of the New Testament renders that. And it's used a couple of other times, so it'll give you an idea of what that verb is actually like. It's the same word that's used, remember when Peter, uh, after the resurrection, they have the miraculous catch of fish, and Peter drags that net up onto the shore full of, what was the number of fish? I never can remember that number, 100 and... 153, you win something. I don't know, Some, give them a prize. Yes, that's right, 153. Or when Paul and Silas got in trouble there with the crowd in Philippi after casting the demon out of the the girl that was fortune-telling and all of that. And uh, the mob dragged Paul and Silas to the magistrates. It's 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 that same verb. And I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, will drag all people to myself. And so I want to have one more, one more painting this morning, one more image. And this is by Andreas Pavius. He was a 15th century Greek painter. And this is his, this is his painting of the crucifixion. Now, this is very detailed, and you can't see it from where you sit. But later on, you just it's Andreas Pavius, the crucifixion. So you Google it. And you get a high-resolution image, and you just look at it because there's so much going on there. Let me describe some things. First of all, you notice that the cross is absurdly tall. I mean, understand, Pavius is is a theological artist. He's not doing journalism. He's not not doing historical, critical, textual analysis. he's, He's making theological points. The cross is absurdly tall because Christ is reuniting, connecting heaven and earth. In the, in the painting, by the way, this is, the images are what lurk behind, on, on this beautiful cover, it's that painting that's behind the wood grain and the cosmos and all of that sort of thing. So that's where that comes from. There are 17 angels flying around. 14 of them have various expressions of grief and sorrow on their face. They're, they're horrified at what they're seeing. Three of them, though, are, are catching in chalices the blood of Jesus. At the very top of the cross, you can maybe make out there, but that's a pelican. There's a pelican on a nest at the top of the cross. Again, this is not historical, critical, literary analysis. This is poetics. This is artistic theology. There's a pelican at the top of the cross. And the pelican is piercing her own breast 
to feed her chicks from her blood. This was, this was a medieval symbol of Christ. You'll, you'll see them. They're, they're still, you can see them in the upper room in Jerusalem. Uh, there's pelicans depicting doing that very thing. That was a medieval symbol of Christ. A pelican piercing her own breast to feed her brood from her own blood. Um, at the bottom of the cross, there are people coming up out of their graves. So there's resurrection. People are coming out of their graves. Not all of the blood is caught by the angels in their chalices. You can't see this really at all, but I can describe it to you. I can tell you what it is. Some of it drips all the way down into death. <laughs> and there's, there's demons down in there that are, that are tor- tormented by the blood of Jesus falling upon them. That's a very interesting painting. You could spend a lot of time at it. Well, in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, he draws the world to himself. And in his crucifixion and resurrection, Jesus Christ recapitulates humanity, recaps, resummarizes, reinstitutes, re reheads. He becomes the new progenitor of the human race. Paul says it this way For as in Adam, for as all die in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ, so that God may be all in all. So, how does Jesus understand his death? He understands it will judge the world. If you see the cross crate, you go, we need a better system. We need a better way of running the world. Secondly, if you sit with it in Revelation long enough, it begins to drive out the Satan who wants to keep the world organized around accusation and violence. And then finally, Jesus has no doubt about the salvific efficacy of the cross, that ultimately, Jesus says, it will draw all people to himself. Now, salvation is not forced upon anyone by coercion, but the gravity of grace is always pulling upon everyone so that my great hope is that from the cross of Christ there emanates a tractor beam of steadfast love, and eventually, Jesus says, it will draw all people into his saving orbit. And that's what's going to happen to us right now because in just a moment we're going to get up and we're going to talk a little bit more about Jesus and his death, and what it provides for us, and it's just going to draw us, and we're going to be drawn to Jesus, and we're going to hear words like, the body of Christ broken for you, the blood of Christ shed for you, and we're going to be drawn to Jesus, and receive the gift of his life, and receive the forgiveness of sins, and the promise of everlasting life, amen? Stand up with me, stand up with me. Let's prepare ourselves. Let's, let's, let's put ourselves in orbit. Let's, let's draw near. And then pretty soon, it's, it's just gonna, that, that tractor beam of grace is going to take hold of us, and we're going to be just drawn. We'll prepare ourselves, first of all, by confessing our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now join with me in confessing our sins and being drawn to the saving mercy of God. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name, amen. And God is gracious to all who confess their sins and in humility ask for mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. And now we're being drawn. (laughs) And this is the table, not of the church, but of the Lord. 
It is made ready for those who love him and for those who want to love him more. So come, you who have much faith and you who have little. You who have been here often and you who have not been here long. You who have tried to follow and you who have failed, come. Because it is the Lord who invites you. It is his will that those who want him should meet him here. The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Amen.